So I often hear from neurotypical wives and they say something along the lines of, well, I don't understand why he can't meet my emotional needs. It's not that difficult. I mean, he works. He's a good worker. He's a good dad for the most part. I mean, he walks normal. He talks normal. He looks normal. I just don't understand. He is not normal. Okay. He is not normal. Now, I'm not saying he's defective or flawed or that there's something wrong with him or something bad about him, but he is not typical. He is wired differently. You can think of autism spectrum disorder as a disorder of social skills and a disorder of emotional intelligence. In other words, he's not going to be really professional at knowing how he feels or how other people feel. So simply think of autism spectrum disorder as someone who has some social skills issues and kind of out of touch with emotions. And that's not normal. But he's probably smarter than me. In fact, on average, people on the high functioning end of autism tend to be smarter than normal people. So there's as many ups as there are downs that come with this disorder. And then when I say that to the NTs, they go, well, okay, I understand that. But I didn't sign up for this. This is not the marriage that I had expected. Okay, I'll give you that. But guess what? He didn't sign up for it either. He didn't ask to have autism. It was given to him without his permission. And he's the one that has to live with it, more so than you. So this business of not being normal, honestly, that could be looked at as a criticism, but on the other hand, it could be looked at as a compliment because in some ways he's above normal. And honestly, I wish some of you NTs could see that. I'm gonna just give you a brief overview of why some of the traits of ASD level one cause a problem in the relationship. Um, with true dyed in the wool ASD level one, it is a developmental disorder. And that's the key term. What does that mean, developmental? It means that the social emotional portion of the brain is underdeveloped relative to the logical part of the brain. So if you have ASD level one, you're somewhat low in social and emotional intelligence. That doesn't mean that you don't have social skills or that you don't have empathy, although she may argue that point. Um, but it does mean that you are low in social and emotional needs, which is paramount. And I like to use the analogy of an eagle versus a chicken. An eagle has wings, uses them often, needs them to survive. If the eagle did not have wings, it would not survive. A chicken has wings, and it could fly, oh, maybe five feet, but it has to run and jump, and it, it might fly for five to ten feet. But it doesn't need wings to survive. Both of them have wings. Okay? So, um... If you are low in social and emotional intelligence, you are also by default low in social and emotional needs. You don't necessarily, I'm, I'm generalizing here, I'm guessing most of the guys in here, they're not really that interested in talking about feelings, how they feel. They may be out of touch about, for the most part, how they feel. They're really out of touch about how she feels most of the time. Um, and when she starts talking about feelings, it is kind of uncomfortable uh, and uh, abstract conversation, especially if she says, well, honey, I feel this way about such and such, and she's expecting you to take how she feels and then apply it to some course of action you're supposed to take. That's really confusing as well. Um, now, I said low in social and emotional intelligence, and I'm also saying high in logic, but sometimes the logic is a bit too high. Um, if you have an overly logical brain, you have a brain that is an overthinking brain that tends to get stuck on one detail, hyper-focused on one detail and fails to see the big picture, hard to generalize, those types of things. So that, in, in, in a worst case scenario, you have a high logical brain that's almost an overthinking brain and you're low in social and emotional intelligence. Now you take her, the NT wife, you have damn near the 180 degree opposite scenario. So you can see immediately why we have this problem. She is high in social and emotional intelligence. She's not as high in logic as you, but um, she has logic, of course, but it's not up there with you. But she has a lot of social and emotional intelligence, and by default, she has what? A lot of social and emotional needs. She is the eagle that has to use those damn wings to survive. Chicken 
you could chop you could chop a chicken's wings off. He would be fine. I'm missing my wings, but I can still do what I want to do. Her, she has to have her social and emotional needs met to a significant degree, or she is going to do what your wife has done. She's going to complain, she's going to get angry, she's going to be hurt, she's going to talk to you about how she's emotionally deprived and uh, has Cassandra syndrome and Lord only knows what else she has thrown at you. So this, this is why we have that dilemma. So the moral to this little speech is it shouldn't be a big surprise to you why there's conflict. And nobody is doing anything wrong. You aren't bad people in here that are behaving badly and you're purposely trying to be selfish, insensitive, uncaring, narcissistic, sociopathic, and whatever other things she's called you. Uh, I'm guessing that the vast majority, if not everybody in here, wants to make her happy. You really wanted to make her happy. You tried to do right, but what I've run into with, with guys that the, on the spectrum is they haven't quite figured out how to get that done and they often say it doesn't matter what I say or do it's never good enough and honestly they're tired of being a failure and they're tired of of hurting her and so what ends up happening is they kind of start disconnecting um, because you know if, if you're no good at basketball and every time you get out there on the court you're an embarrassment to the team eventually you go this and you sit on the bench. So if you're, if you really suck at having that strong emotional reciprocity, that you're super intelligent in the social and emotional sense wife has, and you can never quite get up there at an unconscious level or maybe even a conscious level, you kind of lose hope and you've kind of lost faith in yourself, your confidence is in the toilet, your self-esteem is probably in the toilet, and you almost feel like you're better off just to mind your own business because it's too much trouble. Some of the traits of the disorder look like selfishness, insensitivity, narcissism. She attaches negative motives to the things that you say and do. Because he said this or did that, or be, because he didn't say what I wanted him to say or didn't do what I wanted him to do, therefore he doesn't give a shit about the relationship. Or his work is more important than me. Or his special interest, he's married to a special interest, not so much me. I'm not important to him. She fills in the blanks with that stuff, which keeps you perpetually in the doghouse. So that is kind of like the, I felt like I needed to lay some groundwork down uh, to A, let you know why you're in the position, approximately why you're in the position that you're in, but also to validate that you're not, you're not a bad guy. Although some of you aren't convinced of that, there's the difference. There's a big difference between healthy guilt and toxic guilt. Healthy guilt is I seem to say the wrong thing sometimes and I don't follow through like she wants me to sometimes, and that's a mistake I intend to do better. That's just healthy guilt. There's nothing wrong with that. But, the, but some of the guys in here have made the leap from healthy guilt to toxic guilt, and that is I'm always messing up. I never get it right. I'm always doing the wrong thing, saying the wrong thing, or I'm, I'm supposed to be doing or saying something, and I never do that. And I'm always failing her. And that toxic guilt leads to toxic shame because I'm a social failure in her eyes. Therefore, I'm a failure as a person. In other words, because I supposedly do all these bad things, therefore I am a bad person. And I run into guys on the spectrum that they are there with the toxic shame that they really believe that at their core they're flawed, defective somehow. Which really makes it almost impossible to have a relationship with her because if you've gone that far, you've convinced yourself that there's no use in trying. When I try, it's not even a neutral thing. If I try, I make it worse. And so a lot of you have stopped trying. And of course, just like I said a minute ago, she makes the false assumption that he stopped trying because he doesn't care about the relationship when that's not the case. So what's going on here, guys, is, and this, this sounds a little accusatory, but it's not meant to be. 
because of some of the social and emotional challenges that you have, you haven't met a lot of her expectations or her desire for the emotional reciprocity to the degree that she wants. And it's a little bit like a cancer has developed in the relationship. So if you had cancer or you know somebody who has cancer, there's a long recovery. There's surgery to remove the tumor. There could be radiation chemotherapy, all of these different things, and it could be six months or a year or more before you're clean, before you go back to the doc and said, yeah, we can't, we can't find one cancer cell in your body. For now, you're good to go. You, 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 you beat it. You're done. That's a long-ass process. All of you all in here are right in the middle of that process, and you're just now beginning treatment. So when you feel like it, well, it doesn't matter what I'm doing. I, I can never, it's never good enough. It doesn't matter what I say. I'm always wrong. I'm using these strategies that I learned, and it doesn't feel like things are getting better. You've got to realize that this is, a, this is a long haul deal here. So don't lose your confidence. If you're doing the strategies that we're talking about, you, sh you should notice some improvement immediately. But to get it to the level where you want it, where she's no longer agitated and, and giving you a bunch of grief, that's going to take a long time. Passivity is I'm afraid that I'm going to say or do something wrong. So I'm going to try to say or, and do as little as possible. Anything to keep the peace. We don't want to work that way anymore. Aggressiveness would be she's upset with me. She's nagging me. This makes me very anxious. And now my anxiety is coming out as anger and rage. We don't want that anymore. So we're trying to get into the middle, and that's going to be assertiveness. What she wants more than anything from you is to be empathic. But empathy is incompatible with shutdowns and or meltdowns. Let me repeat this. She's wanting empathy from you. And you're not going to be able to deliver if you're jumping back and forth between passivity and, and aggressive. So you have to be assertive before you can practice empathy. Why your Aspie partner seems to grow cold over time. Unfortunately, the Aspie partner gives no clues up front that his commitment level may wane over time. Neither he nor his partner knew this was going to happen. In the early stages of the relationship, you may have noticed that your Aspie was literally obsessed with you, texting you all the time, saying all the right things, wanting to spend a lot of time with you, etc. However, after a few months or years, he loses interest and instead focuses on work or one of his other obsessions. In addition, his sex drive may diminish drastically. Your Aspie's early passion for you was indeed genuine, but once the newness of the relationship wears off, he feels the need to find a new passion, rather than keeping the former passion alive and pumping. The Aspie never talks about his inner feelings. Instead, he's overly logical. He's very biased to his values and belief system, and finds it extremely difficult to empathize and to understand others' point of view. He may appear highly self-centered and is usually absorbed in his own activities, thoughts, and challenges, which often makes the NT partner feel neglected and unloved. Okay, and this next question is, my husband has many, if not most, of the traits of Asperger's syndrome, but he refuses to talk about it or go for a diagnosis Instead, he says, I'm just blaming him for our marriage problems. I'm about to the end of my rope. Any suggestions? Well, um, if your Asperger's husband's symptoms are threatening your marriage and he chooses to protect those symptoms rather than manage those symptoms, then his priorities may not be conducive to a long-term relationship, quite honestly. And I know that's hard to hear. And notice I do say manage the symptoms rather than trying to fix them or control them. It's about managing symptoms, which is very, very possible. So if his priorities remain the same, you, in this case being the neurotypical wife, need to decide whether or not this is the right relationship for you. Even if he does decide to get a diagnosis and does accept that, as a fact, you still need a strategy to resolve disagreements. I have received probably hundreds of emails from neurotypical wives who say that their husbands are simply in denial. But the bottom line is this. 
your husband has to make a choice about what he values most, his marriage or refusing to seek a diagnosis. There's the million dollar question right there. What does he value most, his marriage or refusing to seek a diagnosis? If he values his relationship with you more than staying in refusal mode, then he'll go and see if he has the disorder. If he values staying in refusal mode more than his marriage, then quite honestly, you'll need to do some serious soul searching to decide whether you're going to stay in this relationship or not. But on a more positive note, there's a certain way that you can go about this that may make him a little more inclined to seek a diagnosis. If your husband has Asperger's but he doesn't know it, it's going to affect him anyway. And if he does know, he can minimize the negative impact while at the same time leverage the positive. And there's many more positives associated with the disorder than negatives. So without the knowledge that he has Asperger's, he may fill in, fill in that void with other more damaging explanations of his behavior. For example, he might say, I'm a failure, I'm weird, I'm a disappointment, I'm not living up to my potential, I'm no good at this marriage thing, uh, I'm a failure, and so on. So he's probably filled in uh, the blank him not knowing whether or not he has the disorder, with some very negative self-talk. So, as you try to talk with your husband about this, you'll want to be sure to discuss his strengths, rather than focusing on the weaknesses or the challenges or the deficits that you have witnessed. And all adults with Asperger's have significant areas of strength. In fact, I'll go one better than that. They have more strengths than deficits. And that's what you need to focus on as you're trying to get him hooked into the idea of going and seeking a diagnosis. So if you'll include a lot of positive things you see in him that may also be related to Asperger's, he's not going to feel attacked by you or blamed by you. And this may make him a, a bit more open to the possibility of facing his fears by going for a diagnosis. And that's what you're running into here with him uh, being in denial is he's, a, he's afraid of what he may find out. So what I run into a lot is the situation where the man in this case, we'll use the ASD man and the NT wife as the example. He is literally afraid of his NT wife at this point when the conflict has gone on for years unresolved. And uh, this usually starts out by she, the NT wife, has not experienced the degree of emotional reciprocity that she wants and needs and desires. A lot of her expectations are not being met. This goes on for quite a few years with uh, good intention. She tries to reconcile differences, trying to make the relationship work, trying to fix some broken pieces. And her good faith effort usually downloads in his mind, the ASD man, as complaining, criticism, being parental, constantly correcting him. And so now he feels like he's on thin ice all the time, like he's in the doghouse much of the week. And I have heard so many self-reports from these men that they honestly are afraid to say much or do much because they just assume that they're going to get in trouble. And so they tend to basically go into shy mode. And uh, this could look like uh, he's spending less time with you. He doesn't really want to engage conversation with you. He may view you as his major source of anxiety. He tends to be preoccupied with other things. And that downloads in the NT wife's mind as he doesn't care about the relationship. I'm not important to him and so on. But in many cases, what's really going on, he is just trying to avoid drama and conflict and arguments. He doesn't feel like he can win and at some level he's given up hope because he's in his mind anyway he has tried numerous things none of which seem to help anything and these men will say this a lot it doesn't matter what I say or do it's never good enough and they are literally afraid and I'm not exaggerating they are con constantly overly concerned for good reason in their mind that it's better to say nothing at this point because when I try to fix it oftentimes it makes a bad problem worse and um, they're basically in a form of flight. And you may notice as an NT wife that sometimes he flips to the other side of that spectrum and goes into fight 
which would be the meltdown, adult temper tantrum, and so on, and then flips back to the shutdown. So the moral to the story then is we need to come up with a communication strategy such that the NT wife can get her point across. In this case, the point being I need to get some of my needs met. Without that downloading in his brain as I'm being attacked yet again, and so I really need to protect myself, and how I protect myself is to disconnect. Hey guys, this is Mark Hutton with AdultAspergersChat.com and I wanted to talk to you briefly today about how to get your Asperger's partner to share the load. One of the things that I always run into when I counsel couples where one person has Asperger's syndrome and the other one is a neurotypical, usually it's the wife that's the NT and the husband that has Asperger's syndrome, is this uh, problem of sharing responsibilities. It's often the case where the NT wife feels that she is taking the lion's share of the load and the husband is kind of slacking off and that's very common and those NT women that are watching this video I'm sure you've experienced that so you do want to allow your Asperger's husband in this case to take on some adult, adult responsibilities of course even if he doesn't live up to your standards um, it's not uncommon for the Asperger's husband to step aside and let you take over because you want things done your way. And this is not letting him grow up. Remember that Asperger's syndrome is a developmental disorder. And so he is literally underdeveloped in the social emotional department. In other words, his social emotional brain is immature relative to his chronological age. So if you insist on being the ultimate decision maker, a judgment caller, he's probably going to shut down and you're never going to get it done. So he may struggle and even fail a few times, but that's a learning curve. So you definitely do want to impress upon him the importance of sharing responsibilities. And one of the things that you can do to help out with this is to create a visual um, cue, even a chore chart because people with Asperger's syndrome are very visual in a verbal world and they do much better when they can see something that reminds them visually. And I know that chore charts and budget sheets sound very childish, but he may need a visual reminder. We all have information overload with too much to do and remember. You know, even neurotypical men do much better when they're handed a honey-do list. So if your Asperger's husband is tech savvy, you can have him enter items in his reminder app. Um, or you could actually create a chore chart, just like you would a child. And I know that that sounds ridiculous at some level, but it works. The reason I know it works is because I regularly recommend this. And, you know, most cases the wife says, yeah, I'm getting a little more out of him now than I did before we had the visual. The other thing that I want you to keep in mind is to not ask him to do more than one or two, three at the most, things at a time because part of the developmental disorder is uh, it's not going to be able to retain a lot of information at one time so I would encourage you to start with one thing tell him you know tell him one thing that he can help you with and leave it at that unfortunately many Asperger's men are genetically wired to reject lists and if you're an NT wife you know exactly what I'm talking about if that describes your man then don't give him a list of things to do now you might be thinking well, what's the difference between a list and a chore chart well the list is not particularly uh, visual I mean I know you have to read it but here's a here's a list so to speak as compared to a chore chart the other thing that would be helpful when possible is to let him decide the timeline this may sound counterintuitive, but it works. Sometimes males need to feel like they're in control, even NT males. But the Asperger's brain, male brain, really feels like they need to be in control. And the minute they feel threatened, they flee, and you're never going to get the job done that you want him to do. If your Aspie takes off because he feels like he's lost control, 
it would be easier and a lot less painful to just go beat your head against a brick wall, brick wall than to try to get him to complete the task. Now, some of you are thinking, well, if I let him have his timeline, it'll never get done. Well, I'm not talking about pushing the task two or three days out or next week. We're talking about a 24-hour timeline here. So you can say, you know, this is what I like for you. This is what I need you to do. And it doesn't have to be done, you know, immediately, sometime within the next 24 hours. If you could get that done, I'd appreciate that. So these are just a few little simple things. It's nothing profound here, nothing even new to you. But uh, it's these are very important things to consider. And they're simple things, but sometimes the simple things are the best things. And there's a link below this video that will take you to an article where there's uh, more information on how to help how you can get your Asperger's partner to share the load, okay? Thanks, guys. Talk to you later. Hey guys, this is Mark Cutton with adultaspergerschat.com and I recently received a rather lengthy email from a neurotypical wife who is married to a husband with Asperger syndrome and I'm just going to condense her email in just a sentence or two. Basically, she was saying that whenever they have conflict, it always ends badly because uh, they just end up fighting and uh, she yells and he shuts down. That's basically what's what goes on in there method for conflict resolution and so in this video I want to look at why the NT wife and the Asperger's husband often have great difficulty in reconciling differences and so in order to look at that we have to look at how each person deals with their stress if the Asperger's man was forced into a situation where he had high levels of social contact for an extended period of time, he would quickly burn out. In other words, he would be so overstimulated that he would have to have some time alone just to recharge his battery. Now let's contrast that with the neurotypical woman. If the NT woman was forced into a situation where there was extended periods of no intimacy, no emotional reciprocity, no sharing of feelings, she would burn out. And as a result, she would need to have connections with people and to share feelings to recharge her battery. So in periods of high stress due to relationship difficulties, the man with Asperger's needs to find refuge in solitude. Conversely, in high stress situations, the NT wife needs to have connection, emotional reciprocity, and to share feelings. So you can see why communication is such a problem between the Asperger's man and the NT wife. The man with Asperger's syndrome needs to disconnect in order to de-stress, while the neurotypical wife needs to connect at an even deeper level in order to de-stress. So this might explain why the Asperger's husband is less aware of the relationship difficulties than the NT wife. During high stress, he can always disconnect. His method for de-stressing is always available. But for the neurotypical wife during relationship stress, she will not likely be able to connect or to share feelings in order for her to de-stress. So it's not uncommon for the neurotypical wife to be the one that complains the loudest is because she's not in the position to de-stress like the Asperger's husband because he just shuts down and seeks solitude and then he's fine. She's not. So to summarize, the NT woman implodes whereas the Asperger's man explodes. If you're in a relationship with uh, a man on the autism spectrum, you may have witnessed many meltdowns and rage attacks. Under toxic relationship stress, the NT woman will want to recruit others, including her husband, to deal with the stress, whereas the Asperger's man will want to keep things to himself and seek solitude. The NT woman will want to seek support and she will associate, whereas the Asperger's man will withdraw and dissociate. And why is this the case? Well, largely because the NT woman has a very highly developed social emotional brain, whereas the Asperger's man has an underdeveloped social emotional brain. He's very low in sociability and empathy. And unfortunately, that's the way he's wired. Asperger's syndrome is 
a developmental disorder by definition, which simply means that developmentally, his social emotional brain is lagging compared to his chronological age. Now, there's many things that can be done to establish effective communication in spite of the fact that the NT woman and the Asperger's man are wired so differently. In fact, if you'll click on the links below this video, we'll get into some methods of what can be done in this case. Thanks, guys. Mark Hutton with AdultAspergersChat.com. Talk to you again soon. So in counseling with couples, I have uh, heard neurotypical wives refer to their Asperger's husband as a robot or Mr. Spock or sometimes even a hologram. And the reason they re use some of these terms is because they say he just lives in his head and you never really hear anything coming from the heart. Uh, in other words, he's overly logical and uh, not very empathic, we'll say. So dealing with Asperger's and high-functioning autism in your spouse can be very difficult. You know, Asperger's men who present themselves as Mr. Logical tend to be afraid of being controlled by others and losing who they are inside of a relationship. In some cases, they may reject emotional attachment as a way of protecting themselves. Now, in many cases, Mr. Logical has trust issues that come from things that happened to him in the past. For example, you know, some of these men may have developed a tough and distant exterior due to being bullied throughout childhood because they had this kind of nerd-like behavior. They were kind of odd or quirky and they got uh, ostracized from their peer group. So if you're trying to get Mr. Logical to feel comfortable talking to you, you want to avoid starting conversations with sentences like, we really need to talk, or this is important. These kinds of lead-ins will definitely trigger a clam-up response. He might feel cornered or pressured by the serious tone of the conversation. You can expect Mr. Logical's emotions to be displayed as actions rather than words. The Asperger's man's emotions are confusing and sometimes contradict each other. Oftentimes they don't even understand their own emotions. Depression often goes undiagnosed because it's difficult for male Aspies to explain what they're feeling or that they feel ashamed for not subscribing to the society norm of a tough, well-adjusted, providing man. So as you may have discovered, your Asperger's husband often has difficulty communicating his feelings. He does not want to tell you that he is sad or depressed. So if you you want to appeal to Mr. Logical's brain, then when attempting to problem solve with him, use rationality rather than emotionality. When you're talking to a logical man, it's vital to talk to him in a manner that he can comprehend. So to express yourself to this type of male brain, realize that he might not think in emotions in the same way that you do. The Asperger's brain operates in a more rational, non-emotional fashion instead. So as difficult as it may be for you, the neurotypical wife who has a very highly developed emotional brain and is highly socially skilled, if you utilize logic, he may find talking and opening up to you more comfortable. He may be more likely to listen to you, understand what you're saying, and cooperate with the changes that you are suggesting and hopefully live up to most of the expectations you have for the relationship.